I'm going to talk to you tonight about getting turtles on track and getting people back on track. And I'm also going to show you how through sheer innovation and passion and probably just sheer will too that you can make a difference. You can bring back what's going off track at the moment. So also I'm taking you on two journeys through this talk. The first journey is, of course, the turtles. Imagine, imagine your mother's gone up a beach. Imagine she's laid 100 to 120 eggs, you and your brothers and sisters. Imagine from that day that you're open to predation from feral animals, from water rising. Imagine 60 days later that you're tweeting to your brothers and sisters, it's time to go. It takes you three days to get to the surface. You reach the surface, you're all running down together and you find that on your way through there's crabs and there's birds taking off your brothers and sisters. Oops, I better get myself right before I get back in the water. So you hit the water and then imagine you've got fish there. Fish are taking your brothers and sisters as they're swimming out. You swim as fast as you can, 50 kilometres out to sea. And that's where you stay for the first five to ten years of your life. Imagine you look around, you're the only one left of your brothers and sisters. Imagine what that's like. I can't, but this is the journey of a small turtle when it's born. How I got into turtles was I fell into it by accident. What happened was that a concerned citizen had been walking along the beach. He watched a dog digging up a nest of turtles. He picked up what was remaining, the 52 turtle eggs. He brought them into the vet clinic where we're at. We put a light on them and we hatched the whole 52 turtles. After I got over the fact that, how cute are they? I thought, what do I do with 52 turtles? It's not something that you can actually take home. So we actually went out, we bought a pool and we put the 52 little turtles in the pool. Then I had to have a steep learning curve. What do you feed them? When do you release them? What do you do? So this led to my journey into turtles. And after we had them for two weeks and we'd fed them, we took them down the beach and we actually put them on the beach and released them. And they looked and they went, I don't know, what am I meant to be doing here? What do I do? So I went down to the water and every morning when we were feeding them, we actually used to call them. And I went down the water and I was calling them and they all came scurrying down the beach and off they went. And they went out into the water through the waves. And then I watched them and I thought, what's their future? What's going to happen? The unfortunate part about it is one in a thousand turtles makes it through to adulthood. So they have a very high rate of loss. And after we watched them go, I thought, well, that's the end of my journey into turtles. I was very wrong. What happened was when I was working in an aquarium, we were actually brought a turtle in that the rangers had found floating out on the Great Barrier Reef. And they asked another marine biologist and myself if we could actually look after this turtle. And so we said, sure. She was about this big. And we named her Daisy because we thought that's a nice name for a turtle. But if anyone's seen Rugrats and seen Angelica, this turtle was Angelica. It was turtle with attitude. <laughs> so she got renamed Angelica. And you can see she's got a nice little smile on her face. How friendly. <laughs> so while we're rehabilitating her, they actually closed the aquarium and we were left with this turtle this big. What do you do with a turtle that big? They don't fit in bathtubs and they actually don't fit in spas. So we were donated our first piece of land down in Cairns and this was the start of Cairns Turtle Rehabilitation Centre. So, of course, being a voluntary organisation, we were relying on people, donating, and Cairns community were fantastic. They rallied together and we set up our first centre. So for the first six years, there was two of us there and we were getting about four or five turtles in a year and that was great. What happened was we had more turtles coming in. But we looked at it too and we thought, why are turtles important? Why do people care about them? Why are we doing this? It's because they're a keystone species. They're also an indicator of the ocean. When you get sick turtles, there's a sick ocean. Also, they're the number one species that people want to see on the Great Barrier Reef. What are the threats to turtles? The main threat to turtles is anthropogenic, so that's man-made. So it's actually marine debris, water quality, boat strike, illegal hunting, loss of nesting beaches and light pollution. So these are things that we can actually do things about. Environmental, we can't. It's loss of feeding grounds, and that's due to unforeseen environmental conditions. And also predation from sharks and from crocodiles, we can't prevent. And climate change, we really can't prevent that much. So these are other threats to turtles. Up in Cape York, 
what happens is it's virtually like a washing machine. So there's discarded fishing nets, they go around the Gulf of Carpentaria, they're indiscriminate killers. This is Princess. She was actually caught in a ghost net. In 2008, I had a phone call. 62 turtles were actually washed up on the beach, caught in discarded fishing nets. I flew up there. Most of these turtles were okay, and they could be released after a few days when we had them in a makeshift triage centre. Two of them, unfortunately, had to be flown down to Cairns for veterinary care. Princess was one of these turtles. In 2011 we had a mass draining event. And as I was saying before, there was two volunteers and then we had another couple come on board. But in 2011, with a mass draining event of green sea turtles, occurred. And this occurred because of unforeseen environmental conditions. It started off in Cyclone Larry, then we had floods, then we had a wet dry, and then we had Cyclone Yazi. The inshore seagrass beds, which is what green sea turtles eat, were wiped out up the east coast of Queensland. We had an 800% increase in strandings. We know we lost over 3,000 out of the population. We went from having four or five turtles. At one stage, we had 55 turtles. What do you do with 55 turtles? We had kiddies pools as far as the eye could see and tanks. And of course, then we needed more volunteers. So we put out a plea. The passion was incredible. People were stepping forward and they were coming to put up their hand to help these turtles. And we have now a group of 210 dedicated volunteers. So it's gone from two to 210. We also do university placements, and these people give up their time to come out and help the turtles. This is just a small group of our dedicated volunteers, and you can see the group in the middle. Then you can also see the turtle that was rescued one day on our way to Fitzroy Island. We saw a turtle floating. The boat that we were going over on stopped, so we threw one of our volunteers over, sacrificed him, and said, it's all about the turtle. <laughs> so, so this turtle weighed about 120 kilos, and we said, you can swim it in, you'll be right. <laughs> so he did. And also, as you can see in the other one, when we released this turtle, it was a bit rough, and I said to them, I don't care what happens, just don't drop that turtle. So as you can see, they didn't. So, of course, with all of this, we needed another centre. Uh, we ran out of room where we were down in Cairns, and we donated our first piece of land over in Fitzroy Island as well. So we set that up. It took three years for us to set the centre up, and we needed then ongoing support. Because our turtles, when they come into care, although green sea turtles eat seagrass, although hawksbills eat sponges, and although olive ridleys and flatbacks eat crustaceans, when they come into care, they all eat squid or prawns, but they're very fussy. They don't just eat normal squid, they actually eat imported squid. The most expensive on the market, of course. And they like tiger prawns and red spot are their favourite, and they have them peeled on a platter. <laughs> this is their centre we built. Rehabilitation, of course, is not just for the rich and famous. Our turtles don't come in with anything, they just come in and they're very sick and they're very scared. So what we do is we rehabilitate them and then we release them back out into the wild. This is not a short process. It can take anywhere between six months and three years. This little guy's rowing in. He wants to come in. <laughs> also, this is some of our releases that we do. So our, as you can see, we're releasing all the turtles. We release as many as we can. When we first started our rehabilitation centre, our success rate was about 30 to 35%. And it was because people didn't realise that when a turtle's on the surface it's actually in trouble. Now through education and through innovation that we now, people are bringing turtles in much more quickly when they see them um, floating out on the reef. And also I think the turtles have learned too, they're coming in a bit quicker too. <laughs> now we have also techno turtle. So in the 20 years since I started, and this is 20 years ago these eggs were brought into the vet clinic, and 15 years since we first started our first turtle rehabilitation centre, we now have technology, and the technology is incredible. We're now very generously supplied the idea we can put a turtle through a CT scan. This gives us information that we've never been able to get before with X-ray. So we can actually look inside the turtle, we can actually see what's happening, and we can see if we can do something about it. Of course, the problem with turtles is you can't operate on them. They've got a shell top and bottom, so it's a time factor. So this turtle here is going through a CT scan, she came in, she had what was called fibropapilloma, and that's actually an alpha herpes disease that they get. It can cause blindness, it can, can cause them 
not to be able to swim. And so we put her through to see if she had internal fibropapilloma. And the bottom one shows she didn't. We also had the other turtle that came in and she had a broken jaw. This next one I've just got to show you because I just love this slide. This is through a CT scan and it shows the whole bone structure of a turtle. This is Princess's story that I was telling you in the beginning that came down from Cape York. That's her in entanglement. That's how she came down. She was horrendous injuries. After six months of rehabilitation, she was flown back up and these flights were actually given to us. We have a very good support from one of the airlines who is fantastic at fly me and the turtles backwards and forwards to Cape York. And this is her going back. And she's the first rehabilitated turtle in Australia that actually had a satellite tracker on her. When we released turtles, we didn't know what happened to them. We released Princess off Weepa and she did 1,980 kilometres in 132 days. So we showed that rehabilitation was both successful and also they travel dis long distances between their breeding grounds and feeding grounds. This is her map of what she did. She went from Weepa to Irinjaira and then she went across to the Northern Territory. Now, with technology, they can actually put GoPros on turtles' backs. And this gives us, they become now citizen scientists. They're showing us. These GoPros are fantastic. They're showing us the environment. They're showing us what's happening. But also with the trackers. The trackers, first lot of trackers that we put on their backs were about $2,000. They gave us GPS points. Now, with a grant, we put trackers on their back that are worth $5,500. They give us a bottom time. They give us a top time. They give us salinity. They give us distance. They give us dive times. With all this technology, we're learning more, and so is everybody else. Also, the benefits of being a, um, a turtle rehabber. You get to be on an island one day. You get to be up in Cape York. But as long as you remember to take your portable toilet seat with you. <laughs> it's very important when you're up at Cape York, I can tell you. <laughs> so let's get back on track. That's turtles on track. What I'm going to do is say, what can you do to help these turtles? We really have got problems. We've, the turtles are either endangered, critically endangered, or threatened. So we need to get back on track. We need to get these turtles back on track. Things that we can do is a plastic, simple plastic bag, tie it in a knot. It stops it from blowing into the ocean. And also, marine debris is the biggest killer of marine turtles. Marine debris is a global problem. It's huge. But we can do something about it. As individuals, we can drive change. It's our choice whether we throw a piece of rubbish on the ground or whether we throw it in a bin our choice, whether we throw something down the sink. All of these things make a difference. We can make a difference. And we've shown this. When you think back at the beginning, Cairns Turtle Rehab Centre started with two people. Through sheer innovation, passion and will, we now have 210 volunteers and we have a program for university students. So it has made a difference. It's installed emotion into people. The emotion has installed conservation and that's what we need to do. Thank you.